Hello to all my incredible listeners, and welcome to another incredible episode of the Nick Lugo Show, where I study the tactics, practices, and principles of some of my favorite achievers. This episode is one that I believe will be one of my hidden gems, one of my favorite episodes, and one of the ones that I will recommend to people, well, throughout a very long period of time, because this man, Darrell Evans, is just absolutely fascinating. The wisdom that he was able to pack into one hour of a podcast episode was just incredible. He, well, he's incredible. He's amazing. He's the host of the Mind Shift podcast. He started and he's the co-founder of yokellocal.com. I'll spell that out. Y-O-K-E-L-L-O-C-A-L.com, which is a digital marketing and strategy agency, which really, well, it's been able to generate over $300 million in client revenue ever since its, well, beginning. This man is a 30-year entrepreneur, and he just has so much wisdom, so much knowledge. And we don't really talk about marketing that much. We don't really talk about sales. We just talk about how to live a great life, how to live with a quiet mind, and, a, and well, how to live a life that you enjoy. He's been through so many problems, so many, well, well, we'll say gut checks throughout his life, and he's here to share all of the wisdom that he's attained from that, and, well, how he was able to overcome the highly stressed nature of his 20s and his 30s and how to get into a life of, well, relaxation, a calm, clear mind where he's really focusing on the journey instead of the destination. So he gives a bunch of amazing tricks on how to do that and how to live with, well, a clear mind and a clear life. So make sure to check out the sponsors in the description below. Make sure to subscribe to this channel and make sure to enjoy this episode with Darrell Evans. Don't say that. You're you're doing some stuff that listen. I've got a lot of perspective on twenty year olds. What do you mean? Well, you know how many twenty year olds I've been around. I'm fifty one. Yeah, yeah. I've got four kids older than you, one younger than you, and oh, wow. I've been around friends of mine who have kids your age. I've coached. I've talked at UNLV where I used to go to school. I, I've been around enough twenty year olds. I'm around enough twenty year olds. You're in the I, it doesn't matter how much money you make. That is not about money. It's about the action and energy and the heart centered energy that you're putting into this work. I read your bio because I don't just jump on shows. You know, I have to like think, am, why, why would, you know, what am I going to be able to add to this show? And I saw you were in college. I'm like, what's this guy doing? You know, and, and, but it was also intriguing because I was a college kid doing, trying to put a mark in my own thing too. Really? So, yeah. So I look, I said like, yeah, this guy's doing some stuff. First of all, you, you published a book. I mean, let's, let's just call that what it is. Just look around the whole interwebs and figure out where a 20 year old has written a book. Yeah. There yeah. probably aren't a thousand of them. Yeah. There I just mean, probably aren't. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, it just, uh, you know, it, I'm jealous it? actually. Shoot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 51 and haven't published a book and I probably have five in me. I just got to figure out what I'm going to do. But um, no, you do, you're doing some cool stuff. I'm honored to be here, truly. I, I look around your bio. I check things out. You went to IU. Not that I have an attachment to IU other than my, my fraternity. Um, <laughs> and I'm thinking, what's a college? So I saw the email. I'm like, IU.edu? I'm being interviewed by a college kid? And I'm like, this, this is kind of cool. What is this guy doing? And, and I'm like, so yeah. So I, I, I'm, 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 honored, I'm honored to be here and, and be on your you. platform because- you're just doing some stuff that 20 year olds just don't do. You want to hear it? It's, it's really, really funny. You know, like all my friends and I, it's, it's like, <laughs> I live in two different worlds. Like all my friends, like friends, like 20 year old colleagues and all that stuff. They are like, they're like, who the hell see, is First it? of all, what 20 year old is going to use the word colleagues? You're already, <laughs> you're already, see, you see what I'm saying? No yeah. 20 year old uses the word colleagues. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, well, man. <laughs> it's, it's true like i'm trying to classify them I'm like you know what i gotta use the big word gotta do it <laughs> but that's the thing you know i um like all my friends are like who's this weird kid like not following the path like you know there are two narratives to it it's like this kid's weird or this kid's special you know and um, <laughs> right <laughs> right right and all my friends that i that i that i'm friends with you know and they're they're all like oh this weird kid like who has a podcast and wrote a book and you know i do a bunch of other weird things like of course i I'm different than everyone else. So like I have a flip phone because I hate iPhones and it messes with my productivity and I have a thousand different things that I do. But, uh, but then, yeah, like I, I move into like this sphere of like podcasting and talking to people that are really highly successful like you. And, um, and they're like, yeah, like 
dude, you're awesome. Like, you know, like you're, you're way ahead of the game. So it's just, it's so fun. So the issue is, here's the thing. And this is something that um, you're going to face this going forward. And I can already tell your, your level of emotional and mental maturity is, is, is well positioned uh, where it comes from. I don't know, but I can tell you this. It, it takes a lot at 20 to go against the grain and going against the grain at 20 is not, you know, dropping out of college and going to party and do drugs and alcohol. And all this. No, we're talking about just going to school, get a good job that the mentality that we were all taught leading up to that stage in life, right? We were taught school was everything, go get a job, get a career and all this other stuff. It takes a lot of uh, strength to go left when everyone's going right. And when I say everyone's going right, I mean, freaking everyone, you know, yeah. 97% of people are going left, you're going right. You're doing things that are like, they can't even put what is a podcast, like some of them are like, what is what is the purpose of this thing? Um, but if they read your bio, they'll just figure that out. Right? You said you're a lifelong, you're going to become a lifelong learner, something I believe in called can I constant right. and never ending improvement. I learned it in my early 20s from Anthony Robbins. And you're saying I'm going to be a learner. And then I'm going to share with you what I learned. Yeah. Like <laughs> some people are like, well, why are you going to, sh why do you want to learn so much? Why do you want to share it with everybody? That's how expansion happens. Right. And you're learning, you've, you've got something, something's gotten that into your space. And, and I applaud you for it because it is going to be a differentiator and let's be clear about something else. Uh, by the way, are we on the podcast? <laughs> we're just yeah. talking, right? Yeah, we're just going. No. We're... So listen, here's something that most people don't understand and they don't get the distinction. And there are four levels to creation of value in life. And value to a lot of people comes a lot of different ways, right? A lot of times people think, are you familiar with uh, Kiyosaki's work, Robert Kiyosaki's yeah. work? Rich Dad, Rich Dad, okay. Poor Dad, yeah. Rich Dad, Poor Dad, in the cash flow quadrant, right? So I'm talking a little bit from that. I'm talking a little bit from another mentor of mine. But so you think about the way we earn income. Let's just talk about income for a second. And that is, A, we're an employee of a company, and we are typically either doing something with our hands. In most cases, we're still doing something with our hands. Even if today we work in the digital world, we're at a computer. I've been in my computer for 20-something years now. Uh, there are other folks out there building houses who are using their hands. There are other people who are artists who are using their hands. There are other people who are architects who are using their hands. They're using their hands to get paid. Well, a lot of times people take the step that Robert likes to talk about, which is become an entrepreneur. They go from self, uh, they go from uh, employee to self-employed and somehow they wear the badge that they're now a business owner. Well, and that, that is actually not true. What you've done is simply move from someone paying you to do to you paying yourself to do, but you're still doing the doing. And the doing is still with your hands. If you're a doctor, you leave a medical practice where you were getting paid by a firm to be practicing medicine to now you own the firm. If you're a law firm, if you're a lawyer, you get out of college, you go work at a firm, you're an associate, you're doing the work of, a, of, of being an attorney underneath the umbrella of a firm. And then when you put up your own shingle, you're still doing law work as an attorney, but you own the practice. And I like to say you own a job. And that's what, unfortunately, 95% of most entrepreneurs, they own a job. The very thing they left is what they actually now own. <laughs> mm -hmm. oh and that was the quote that was a quote you had in your website right i'd ra it was a entrepreneur quote i'd rather work 80 hours a week just so i don't have to work for somebody for 40 hours a week yeah and and people you rattle off i see these quotes on the internet about entrepreneurship and it's just can we cuss here yeah it's yeah. just bullshit <laughs> listen to what you're saying you're telling me <laughs> you'd rather we're, and I know everybody, anybody here who's, who's seen these quotes, all you got to do is Google it, right? Just, I'd rather work 80 hours a week for myself than 40 hours a week for a company or a boss or whatever. You are absolutely lying. You know, what you think is that you have the pride of ownership because at least you're not doing what the quote unquote company was telling you to do or your boss was telling you to do. By the way, uh, I don't know the exact statistic, but it's easy to find. Um, most people, in the United States, particularly, I'm assuming now that I'm developing some international connections and executive leadership through my podcast, I'm imagining it's the same because humans 
are the same, no matter where we are born, no matter where we live, or we have some cultural things and some, some, some things we do geography, uh, different, um, but we're all humans and people leave jobs because of the boss, not because of the work. Yes. Right. Bosses run good people off. So the reason why a lot of people do what Michael Gerber would say, which is to have an entrepreneurial seizure and they go start a business, by the way, the e-myth is a book you want to pick up. And that's what ends up becoming the reason why a lot of great professionals who are highly skilled, who are phenomenal at what they do with their hands, and we'll just keep the word hands being the, the, uh, the, the analogy here, it doesn't mean they have to do it with their hands. Um, they get tired of being the best in their world and the boss doesn't appreciate them. And as Gerber describes it, they, they're like, forget it. If Tom doesn't appreciate me, I'll go start my own thing. Because if I wasn't here, Tom wouldn't even be as successful as he is. That's the story that typically plays out. And I've seen this now over the last 20 something years. Um, here's the problem though. Now you get into quadrant two, as Kiyosaki would talk about it, you own a job and you don't take vacations. You, because now you just don't get to do with your hands and earn the money. That's why the, that's why the quote is, is garbage. You don't want to work 80 hours a week. Otherwise, you would have been working 80 hours a week before. The truth of the matter is when you work for the job, you do as little as you have to do to get as much money as you can get from them. And they pay you as little as they can <laughs> to get you to do as much <laughs> as they can get you to do. That's it's so a funny. contradiction. But then you go work for yourself and you're like, well, it's okay if I work 35 hours a week or, or I'm sorry, 80 hours a week. And then you end up owning a job. And here's what I've seen over the last couple of decades, especially the last 11 years uh, coaching and working directly with companies on growth is I talk to entrepreneurs and here's what they tell me. I built a business that I can't get away from. I don't have a team I can trust. I haven't taken a vacation in years. And if I did take a vacation, I had to take my laptop, my computer, my iPhone. I had to keep checking in with the team. Um, I can't keep employees uh, on teams. I can't get them to be productive. I can't make sales without me. The brand is all about me. And I, you know, I feel trapped. I can't, I mean, these are real conversations. These are real conversations with real people. And this is on top of financial concerns and, economic tidal waves and things of that nature. I mean, I'm, these, this is the daily life of a lot of my clients when they come to work with us. And so we say, look, and most of them come to me for marketing and sales acceleration, right? They come to me for client acquisition, customer acquisition, revenue growth. And in many cases, we have to stop and unwrap their thinking as an entrepreneur so that we can understand that they are actually in the way. And the reason they're in the way is because they don't understand all of the other facets of the business they understand their technical expertise. And so we, we, we don't have to go down a rabbit hole here, but you know, the next level of the next level of value is when you build a business that runs without you, right? You, you know, Kiyosaki would say you have to have a company that's, or, you know, I think his definition is 500 employees or more. I disagree. I disagree. My companies, you know, most of the companies I help don't have 500 employees, right? If I own a business, I don't have to have 500 employees for the business to run without me. And what does it mean run without me? It means things won't break if you disappear. And I got this definition from a business coach of mine, I don't know, probably seven to 10 years ago. And he says, you know how you run a good business? You know how your business is running well? Is when you can be gone for two weeks and never check in with your office. And when you get back, there are no fires. Like that's just like measurement number one. There's a lot of three, four day weekend entrepreneurs where they can get away for three or four days, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and they're back in on Monday. They do that four or five times a year. And they think those are vacations. Those are not vacations. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> those are not, not vacations. Enough. They go away for a week and they check in once or twice, or they say, only call me team if it's an emergency or the client only call me if it's an emergency. That's not a vacation. And I just drew the distinction, and this was over 10 years ago, that it, as, as I grew into this different level of understanding of a business, it doesn't have to be 500 employees. At the time when I started to accept this destination and think that it doesn't have to be 500 employees, because that also is the trap. Like, what kind of business do I have to build that has 500 employees? Well, I, that's why I don't agree with the definition. He's super smart, love his work. I'm just saying that salt, 
entrepreneurs with smaller companies, you know, two, probably not two, but probably five to a hundred employees, this rule applies. And that is you need to build a business that where you can leave for the week. And by the way, I turn off my email. When I say turn it off, Nick, it leaves my phone. It's mm -hmm. deleted from my, the apps are deleted. I can't even check the email. Social goes off. First of all, I have no notifications on my phone for anything other Smart. than telephone calls. That means nobody can reach me unless I want to be reached. By the way, I'm not a billionaire, right? It's not because I'm so special. It's because I believe that entrepreneurs should have a business that serves their life, which means you have to start with designing the life you want first. It's irrespective yeah. of money, right? It's irrespective of money. You can design the life you want. Here's an example. I had a former business uh, over a decade ago for, I was, I was in that company for 12 years. We had that business and I was getting calls before hours, during hours, after hours, by the way, at that time I'm coaching youth football, which was one of the best times of my life with my best friend. We were I just had the time of our life for seven or eight years. And I'm at football practice with these kids trying to be a beacon of not just a game that I love so much, but to teach them life skills at the same time, because we were coaching kids and we had rules of what they had to have for their GPA and all this other stuff. And the funny thing wow. was, I was in a business in an industry where there was just a, there was just a historical lack of boundaries in the profession. Meaning if I want to call you now, you should answer the phone now and I'll call you until you answer the phone. And then if you don't answer the phone, you know, we're going to have a problem in our business relationship could come to an end because my, I'm important. Right. And, and I don't want to get into the dynamics of it, but the bottom line was after I did that for a number of years, I was really successful at it. But the problem was I'm like, I don't like this anymore. I could care less. The money was great. I could care less yeah. because this isn't feeding my life. I got kids. I've got these kids on the football field. I've got my kids. I've got relationship. I've got time. And during that window of time, Nick, I only took one two week vacation. So this isn't me being on a pedestal saying I've always created it right. These were in my thirties and I walked away from that business, sold it in fact. And I was like, I don't ever want to do that again, ever. No one will ever call me after five o'clock unless I, unless I initiate the call. No one's going to call me on the weekends unless I initiate the, the call. I won't work on the weekends unless I decide to initiate the work, which I do. I can choose when I want to work. Um, I don't respond to email before 8 a.m. I don't respond to email ever when I'm out of town. I don't respond to email when I'm at a conference, which a lot of people do. They just run to their email on a break. Uh, I'm in masterminds and I'll see everybody at the break on a mastermind and they're just tied up on the phone for the next 20 minutes of the break at the mastermind. I'm like, what are you doing? Like your day is to work on you. The mastermind is to work on you and your business, not be in the business. You're supposed to be here to work on the business. Yeah. So we, we just are working towards building the life first that we want with a, a clear picture. And then we reverse engineer how we get there. It doesn't mean you can just jump from, you know, a hell hole that you may be in now to unwrapping it, but you can do subtle things. And that's just part of what I call in what I teach, which is the mind shift method, which is shifting your thoughts about what you think is normal and what you think is, is uh, mandatory in your life, because you get to control every outcome. I mean, you're a perfect yeah. example of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the perfect thing, you know, I like to think about this all the time. And, you know, first of all, I just let you go because I thought that was incredible. But um, but I like to think about this all the time as sort of pizza slices. Right. And I like to imagine my life as as 100 percent of a pie. And one of the things that I've noticed in amongst friends, amongst the people who are really the grinders, you know, mm -hmm. um, their life is their work right? It's the whole work to live or live to work type of thing. And the thing that I realize is their life is their work, but not because they are, and this might be true for some people, completely dedicated to that work. Like they absolutely love the work and they want to work. Like they willingly work a hundred hours a week, something like an Elon Musk. But in reality, they've just spent so much time trying to build up that work, trying to build up that one piece of the pie. And you imagine there are multiple different pieces like relationships and, and all mm -hmm. of those different things that at the end of the day, that's the only thing they have left. 
the only thing that gives them any sort of, you know, joy, the only part of their life that actually gives them some sort of, you know, sustenance is their work. And that's why, oh, I'm sorry about that. And that's why they're going to give you some call at, you know, at seven o'clock, eight o'clock at night. Exactly. exactly. Because they and have, they know your sleep. Exactly. They, they know they, your they, sleep. Cause they start the voicemail with, uh, Hey, I, I know you're asleep right now, but I wanted to, I was up, you know, I needed to get this out. You know, that's what they say. Nice. Why did you bother? Like, wait till eight o'clock when you know I'm at the office. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. But that's the thing. That's their life. Right. So it's 10 o'clock at night and they're like, all right, I have nothing yeah. left to do. I have no other pieces of the pie to do. So yeah. I guess the question is, how do you build it? Right. So what, what are the other, yeah. how do you, how do you manage people call it work-life balance, but I like to yep. see it as something more of just like, how do you juggle all of these different priorities yep. in such a, such a way? Yeah. So it's great question, a great uh, preface. And I, I started, I used to try to have work-life balance. I used, now I call it work-life integration. And mm -hmm. I've been calling it that now for like the last 10 years, because the reality is when you're an entrepreneur, it never goes off. Yeah. There's never not a vision that is yet to be fulfilled. There's never not a project to be worked on. There's never not a goal. You never, I've learned this as I've gotten, again, this last decade has been a real work in mental a shift in my mental perspective, not against what I've always believed, but in shifting subtle beliefs about what I always thought was true. So work-life balance, uh, I have just decided that for me, it's work-life integration. And mm -hmm. what do I mean by that? What I mean is, is the business, and by the way, the answer to your question is time blocking. It's 100% the way I do it. It's time blocking. That means that when I schedule something, when I commit to doing something, it goes on my calendar or I don't do it. So mm -hmm. that means I make decisions in a way that are either hell yes or no. It's not maybe. It's not in between. It's not let me think about it. It's hell yes or no. And the minute it's a yes, it goes on the calendar. When I accepted the invite to be on your show, it goes on the calendar. It's not, I don't let anything get in the way. You know, I, I had a situation yesterday where Someone uh, wanted to speak with my, my, me about uh, my company helping their company grow, and they missed the meeting. They just missed the meeting. Now, I don't think the entrepreneur intended any harm by it, yeah. but unfortunately, missing the meeting now puts him out three weeks from getting back on my calendar because I don't run a business where I have all of this white space because I'm very intentional, which means this morning before our interview, my calendar had my workout on it. I had just finished my workout before taking a shower, getting my, my protein, my, my, uh, my nutrition shake to then sit down and have a conversation with you. So what I don't do is I don't punt what's on my calendar to make up for someone else's, uh, call it lack of commitment. <laughs> yeah. So I use the calendar, Nick, and, and, and this is my personal life. What goes on my calendar? Um, my personal time in the morning, meditation, prayer, fitness, stretching, reading, uh, podcasting, whether I'm hosting my show or on shows like yours, uh, which again, I'm super honored to be here, dude. You, you're an amazing dude. Um, office meetings, business meetings, travel meetings, whatever those that they go on the calendar. If I'm going to see my grandkids in Texas calendar, if I'm going, if I'm cooking dinner, by the way, I'm the cook in my house. I cook three times a week and, and then uh, wow. other times I'm the cook. So that means no meetings after three o'clock ever, any day of the week, period, period. I don't care what wow. time zone you're on. We figure it out, right? Um, everything goes on the calendar. So to me, it's people not having a calendar that they stick to. Um, are there variations and are there some, some rule breaking in there? Yeah, but it's a 3%, 4%, 5% break of a rule when something comes up. So that to me is the work-life integration. Again, we've already talked about vacations. Uh, we've talked about weekends. And <clears throat> when you get intentional, Nick, you'd be surprised how things line up. Well, and that's what I, I've learned to be intentional about what it is that I want in such a way that it doesn't conflict with, you know, I used to be a, you know, and there was a window of time when, you know, I was sort of in the limelight of my, of my run with this business, not this current company, but my previous company in my thirties, uh, it was in the mortgage industry. If you, if you, you may have heard that in some, uh, somewhere online or whatever, but so I used to own a mortgage company and 
and we were in the middle of the boom and it was, it was, it was demanding. It was fun. It was rigorous, very profitable. Um, but it was an industry for me that, and I really thought I'd be there for 25 years. I thought it was going to, you know, take me home. And I just, again, got back. I was doing some work with a business and life coach. And when I did the work of designing my life 25 years out, you know, <laughs> it just get, it became apparent that the way the mortgage industry was structured and I didn't see mm -hmm. it changing. So the question is, is most people will see what they think they want or say that they want or what they intend to have in their life but then they will be attached to the very thing called money and they'll make excuses about what they say they want for lack of giving up the money to go create the new life that they want. And I left that career when I was doing really well. I'll just leave it at that. And I walked away and I was like, yep. In fact, I actually put my business on cruise control the last two years. When I say that, I mean, I mean, I was still earning a, a sizable income and I was probably just, I was just trying to figure out what I wanted to do next and well, so um, i was a, mm -hmm. so let me ask so i mean all these all these points come back to one real underlying point which i think is really important to note it's the intention as well as the you know going back and really thinking is this worth it for me 25 years down the road mm -hmm. it all comes back to clarity of mind right yep. clarity of mind and this is something that i struggle with really really well I've been getting better, but I'm definitely, you know, I'm definitely still struggling with it, especially when it comes to calendars and, and doing all those things. Yes, I have a calendar, but at the same time, I find myself not blocking. I find myself having mm -hmm. a block and saying, okay, I'm going to have this one hour block. And then the time comes and I just completely ditch the idea. Yeah. And what I've realized is that this idea of yes, the hell yes, or a no, right? A really strong boundaries. That was Having a distinction. This... Yeah. It's a distinction. It's, it's hell. Yes. Yeah. Or yeah, no. exactly. Right. <laughs> like it's, it's not a... see if you just say, yes, I'll do it. Your energy already says you don't want to do it. Yeah. Right. And then you don't, and, and I'm a believer. It. I'm a believer. I got taught when I was a kid, keep your word. Your mm -hmm. word is your bond. I just, that was one of my early lessons in leadership. If you say you're going to do it, do it. And, and by the way, and when you do it, do it a hundred percent. Yeah. Don't show up and sense. give don't show up and be, oh, I'm tired. I feel like it, but no, either you do it or you don't do it. Right. As Yoda would say as from the, from the great, uh, philosopher Yoda, you know, <laughs> do or don't do, there is no try. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Shout out to Yoda. <laughs> Shout out to Yoda. And I like that, you know, I like the fact that yes, like I find myself so muddled in my daily life and I find people tend to be overwhelmed by all their responsibility in this responsibilities and especially if you're trying to do things like juggle you know your social relationships as well as your work life and and all of the things in between so i see you're a big reader right you got about a thousand books behind you right here no, maybe it's not, a <laughs> not a thousand but, <laughs> but maybe it's a I contributing am. factor you know so what do you do to gain this clarity of mind meditation books what else well so yeah, I started reading in my twenties at your age. Um, and that was, as I started my entrepreneurial journey and I realized just like you, that a lot of my friends weren't interested in the idea of entrepreneurship, of course, go back 30 years ago and entrepreneurship wasn't nearly as sexy a topic as it is today, uh, yep. 2021, uh, 2021. And in the last really five years, it's really just taken a whole nother shape. And I'm super excited about it because I've been preaching entrepreneurship for a long time and it's great to see it coming to life. I, I took to books because I needed help. I needed mentorship. I needed guidance and I needed it in areas that I wasn't getting obviously at school, not, you know, nothing wrong with school, but I was on a finance track at school. Um, and so that became the reason for the books and, and a philosophy I learned in my early twenties, uh, called constant and never ending improvement, which is actually, uh, the, the original word is Kaizen, uh, which was adopted by the Toyota, Toyota motor company. Um, I if you're interested in that, read Awaken the Giant Within by Tony Robbins. Incredible yeah, book. So, this is that changed my life when I was 16 years old. Really so did. Second, second book I read, actually. Second book on personal development that I read. So the first one was Unlimited Power. Second one was Awaken the Giant Within. It's wow. sitting right behind me, behind some of these other ones. <laughs> yeah, no, game changer, right? Game changer. And changed so I my committed life. my life to Kaizen. I committed my life to constant and never-ending improvement. Little did I know, I already was committed to it you know, through previous work in school, previous uh, work in, in my sports career, 
uh, which I knew I wasn't going to go play pro sports after I got out of high school, but the work that it took me as an undersized linebacker, I mean, so we, you know, I already had it ingrained in me and then it's mm -hmm. become my life mission and motto and how I operate. And well, so, and I distance myself from people that can't do it or don't do it. Well, that's the thing, you know, I've noticed, especially as I'm, I've embarked on something like an entrepreneurship journey, you know, when I, the more I immerse myself in this idea of, you know, growth and yes, like working super hard and getting stuff done and really getting above the other entrepreneurs that are out there. I also realized that throughout that time, I throw away some of the, some of the foundational cores, you know, and, you know, reading, sometimes sleeping, right. Sometimes, you know, you, you list all the things, health, all these right. and relationships too. And I ended up throwing those pieces of the pie outwards. And I thought it was really interesting. You know, when we got on this call, you said that um, you said that you like to take 30 minute breaks between meetings, right. And I you do. like, and you like to really, you know, space out your meetings. And what I've noticed is that throughout every single thing that you do, it's all about clarity of mind. It's all about yeah. keeping yourself grounded and not getting lost in this what I like to call the rat race, right? Like yes. the entrepreneurs, if I'm working 90 hours a week, I'm stuck in the rat race. I'm just doing, I'm not thinking, I'm not evaluating. I'm just, I'm just working with my hands essentially. So what practices do you, um, do you use to keep clarity of mind? And at the same mm -hmm. time, what, it, like what taught you clarity of mind in this way? What books? Burnout. What? Burnout. <laughs> Experience. Nick, burnout. Listen, I'm I'm no listen. I get to talk to you on the other side of the problem. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> burnout, man. Listen, I disrespected sleep in my 30s. I disrespected not. I didn't disrespect my relationships because there was there was a dynamic in my relationship world that that made it top of mind. So I did. I won't say I did that. I didn't damage that. Um, but I will tell you that I was all in on entrepreneurship and I was all in on what I perceived to be success as an entrepreneur. And what I realized is that you can chase uh, down a rabbit hole, whatever the rabbit hole is in your life. It doesn't have to be entrepreneurship because this is a problem. We can become obsessed. And I love the word obsessed. Some of my favorite athletes, we watch them go to the hall of fame. They had to be obsessed to get there. Yes. Um, you talk about Elon early in our talk, obsessed, uh, jobs, Steve Jobs, obsessed. That word is a very uh, real word. However, what we have to be careful of is we have to be mindful that the obsession with the delivery of the thing, the gift, the message, the model, the product, the service, it shouldn't come at a cost. And I think at some point you will realize, and your body tells you, by the way, when you're out of balance. And so yeah. you talk about how do I get clarity? Well, I started getting clarity when I started really paying attention to my energy. So when it becomes hell yes or no, it, that's an energetic answer. Mm. That's not just my head answer. It's how do I feel about the invitation? I got an invitation just yesterday, put it in example. Someone invited me and I don't know, I think she's in Canada and she sends me an invitation on LinkedIn to come join a networking group that is, it meets two times a month virtually amongst these leaders, et cetera. And, and so for me, energetically being in a networking group is a no. It's yeah. just a no. I don't really care who's in the group. First of all, if you don't charge me to be in the group, then I know it's not the right group for me. And that's just something I believe in. People don't pay. If they don't pay, they don't pay attention. Mm. And I've done enough of it. Like there's, a, I've done enough networking in the old traditional sense. I'm not saying connecting with people isn't important. What I'd rather do is if I go to a conference where I paid to be there, if I go to a mastermind where I paid to be there, if I paid to go to a charity function in a gala or uh, an event and I paid a ticket to get in there, I want to network there because everybody paid a ticket to get in there, right? And that's just a belief for me. Going back to clarity. Yes, uh, in the last decade, I've, I've uh, developed the habit of meditation, the practice of meditation. It is an evolving practice for me. I became extremely intentional about carving out the first 30 minutes of my day, sometimes hour of my day, um, in terms of being intentional about my state of mind when I wake up before I get into the world's demands. Listen, when you you're can an take entrepreneur- us through. Yeah, take us through. So what do you do? What time do you wake up? And what yeah. do you do for that first hour? So I don't wake up with an alarm clock, which was another practice mm -hmm. that I, I picked up on. I stopped waking, I stopped using an alarm clock. And by the way, 
that was just an energetic thing. Again, the world says you got to set an alarm clock. Yeah. I decided what if I could just wake up when I'm done sleeping? <laughs> that means my body is telling me it's okay to get up right now. So I typically wake up and I go to bed generally between nine 30 and 11. I almost always wake up between five 30 and six. If I go over six, it's maybe six, 10, six, 15, actually, which, which uh, was today. Actually, I woke up like six, 16 today, okay. but here's, what's interesting. When I wake up, when I'm done sleeping, I don't feel the immediate stress that most people feel because they think they woke up late. Mm. You see, I yeah. wake up when my body says you've achieved enough rest for the night. And when I get up, the, the first thing that I do is I, I avoid the insatiable. You said you carry a flip phone. So you, <laughs> you yes, keep I yourself do. from running to the internet, which is pretty cool. Um, but my meditation app is obviously on my phone. So how do I avoid getting sucked into email? Well, I have no notifications on my phone, Nick, none. That's incredible. None. My daughter, my 17 year old daughter, high school, senior youngest in the family, she knows, and she's a text message, you know, she's a texter, you know, cause that's what the kids do at that age. They just text, 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 text. I say, if you need me, you better pick up the phone and call. You better dial the number because I will get the ring on my phone, but these phones, these smartwatches, they'll allow you to get notified just as bad as a telephone. I yeah. mean, just as bad as a smartphone. So basically I bracket off notifications. I immediately go and drink two, uh, 16 ounces of water. That's the first thing I do every single day. And I've done it for a decade, if not a little bit more. Why do I do that? Well, we've been asleep for six to eight hours and our body is actually dehydrated. So I, okay. I rehydrate quickly. And I do that with a, just a lukewarm room temperature bottle of water. And I get that down before I go get coffee or anything else. The next exercise is I put on my headphones, the same ones I'm wearing here. And I like these because it shelters out over the earbuds. I can shelter out all the noise. And I put on a, a meditation track. It, some days it'll be a guided meditation. Other days it'll be a musical meditation where I'm just listening to spring water, river water. I'm a big fan of the ocean. I love uh, harmonic sounds. I just, you just, you just Google this stuff. It's on YouTube. It's on Spotify. They're all free. And I just let my mind be, and then I pull out my stretch mat and I, I do, I take my body through some stretches. Um, and I just let my body tell me what I need to stretch that day. Uh, maybe yesterday I had a, and I did, I had a tough leg workout and this morning my legs were really achy. So I, I stretched legs this morning. Some days okay. I'll sleep a little weird and my back's bothering me. So I just go through a stretch routine for like 10, 15, 20 minutes. Um, and, and I just, and then sometimes I just sit some days I don't stretch cause maybe I don't feel like I need it. And I'll just sit Nick for, for 15 or 20 minutes, never usually more than 20 minutes. And I just close my eyes and just sit. I don't get caught up in all the mantras. I, I I've done it all. <laughs> I've done all the mantras and I just sometimes just sit and listen to the sounds. Sometimes I just sit, but the biggest thing I'm trying to do is to quiet my mind. I'm trying to keep whatever the day's priorities out of my thinking pattern. If that comes up, I just try to let that come and go. I just try to let that just come and pass. I don't try to stop the thought. I just don't try to engage with the thought. And I just let that pass. What does it do? Uh, if you're a high performer, if you're an achiever, if you're called on from people to produce, if you're a leader, inevitably, uh, there are demands waiting on you in your inbox. There are demands waiting for you in your inbox, whether that inbox is on social media, where it's on, whether it's on email, whether it's on text, whether it's on voicemail, there are more inboxes and ways for people to put their agenda into your life. And so I just push people's agenda away as long as I possibly can. And typically that's until 7.30 or eight o'clock in the morning. And what I do is go to the gym after that. And what I do, Nick, is uh, in my 20 minute warm up at the gym is when I open my email and check my email. Okay. So I'm actually not wasting time sitting in front of the computer, getting sucked into email. I'm actually exercising and getting my body warmed up while I'm looking at and responding to email. And I'll stop it kind of here, but here's the, here's the hack. Okay. I don't open all my emails. Hmm. I hit select all. I look at who the sender was and I uncheck all the senders that I'm familiar with and everybody else goes to the trash box. Interesting. If I'm unsure, if I'm unsure, I look at the subject line. If I can't determine it, I'll uncheck it. So basically I select all and my first option is to hit delete. 
So I learned a four-step product, productivity system back in 2001, 2002. Uh, still to this day, I think it's uh, one of the best systems I've ever used uh, by a gentleman by the name of David Allen. The book is called Getting Things Getting Done. Things done. Yeah. So his four steps are when you have something coming at you and something in your face, something in your inbox, a request, you got four choices. Okay. Do it. Do it. And if, and do it means it takes less than two minutes to do. If it takes less than two minutes to do, just do it. There's no sense in opening that email and then putting it in your, I'll do it later box. <laughs> if you can do yeah. it in less than two minutes. So do it. If it's less than two minutes, if it's not a less than two minute thing, then you have to put it, you have to put it in defer it, which means put it into a process, put it on your calendar, put it into your project calendar list or project okay. bucket list. Um, so do it, defer it delegate it or delete it. Mm, okay. Make those four decisions super quick. And if you, because we waste a lot of time and energy deciding. Yeah. So I have a very simple process. And so in most people, I'm not the best, you're a psychologist, you're, you're studying psychology. <laughs> you can tell me the truth of this. Maybe I um, could help. The human brain has two primary functions. I've been told. Yes. System one and system two. Okay. And, and they, and my understanding is one of them is to conserve energy. It's to help you conserve energy. So, and, and I may be paraphrasing it at a very light level, but I was told your brain's job is to help you conserve energy. Okay. So, so we'll, we'll see where you're going with this. So what's the second one? No, the, well, I don't, I, I this, the first one is the one I'm mostly concerned with. Right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, Keep that safe, is right. Is I'm sorry. It, there's a lot of sounds in the background, but no, uh, you're fine. You're fine. Yeah, no, apparently. So I'm almost, I'm happened. almost, I think the second one is it is relative to, to keeping you safe, right? It has, it has that, uh, um, yeah, like the, survival. The one that, survival mechanism, right? So the, yeah. the thing that people don't realize is every minute you spend exhausting energy going back to the hell yes or no scenarios, it's the same thing in all these emails. Why do you have to read every one's agenda who just showed up in your inbox. So there's a system, right? So do it, delete it, do it, delegate it, defer it, delete it. So I start with delete because it's easiest and it will clear up the 150 emails down to five or seven. Yeah. I don't open all the emails. Guess what? If someone in that list, I blew it and they don't hear back from me in two or three days, I guarantee you they'll send me back a message. Guarantee it. And let's be clear about another thing. If they're in my inbox and they're important to what I'm working on or we're connected in some way, they also have a way to get a hold of me on my phone or anywhere on social. So that's why I don't worry about it. Number two, I look for who, who, who is sending me something that I need to get to someone else on my team. Because just because I'm being asked to do something, here's an example. Someone asked me to be on their podcast or someone's pitching me to be on my podcast. They want to be on my podcast. Well, that immediately that belongs to my executive assistant, not me. Mm -hmm. She understands our vetting. She understands what shows I want to be on. She understands what we want from our guests. That immediately gets forwarded to her, which is delegated to her. I'm out. I don't even, I don't have to look at the guest name. I'm out. She gets to be the governor of who goes on and where I go. So that's a good question. So when did you find out about this interview? Like what was sort of the the steps? So I, yes, I, I talked to yep. Nicole first and then yep. when did you start seeing it and prepare for this interview? On the calendar. When it hit my, so I look at my calendar once a week of okay. upcoming events. So I always look at the upcoming week on a Saturday. Okay. And that's when I start researching, especially if I, it's a, it's an opportunity like you and I meeting for the first time in this channel, then I, in, I, I research you. So I take time to research you your, your content, your show structure, what you're trying to produce in the world, because I don't want to show up out of alignment. <laughs> At mm -hmm. least my intention is. So I think a lot of podcast guests, they come on shows and they get caught up in who they are. And I'm trying to be caught up in who you are, right? I'm trying to be caught up in what are you trying to produce? And can I accent that in some way? Can I be of value to you and your audience? I don't care. I'm not on a podcast tour because I've got books and I want my book to go to the bestseller list or whatever. I'm trying to add value because of my experience and my walk in life. And if I can share that back to you and your audience, then that's my intention. So I looked at your show. I looked at you. I looked at your, your work, your book that you wrote. I looked at your blog. I, I, I looked at 
what you're doing your blog for and the podcast for. And then I realized this kid's still in college. <laughs> and I was just blown away. I'm just like, for crying out loud, you know, and I didn't have to go back to my assistant and say, I have to go back to, to Nicole and say, Nicole, why'd you book me on this college kid show? That, that, that's just not how we operate, right? She understands who I want to be and how I want to serve. And she saw that as well because she checked you out. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the things that I've noticed from you is that, first of all, you're exceptional, right? You're exceptional. Like most of the podcast guests that I have on here don't do any of that. They're just like, okay, you know what? I have a podcast in 30 minutes. I guess I'm just going to go into it. And that's the end of it, you know? But yeah, like, you know, first of all, you take the time. You're very organized, right? Everything's perfectly organized. And uh, perfect. Now, don't, don't yeah. perfect <laughs> it's habitual. It's actually habitual. Let, let's actually talk about that, right? It's when, you know, when we, when did you learn how to ride a bike? Uh, God, that's embarrassing. 15 yeah, years you were, old. Okay. You're 15, but you learned old, how to tie yeah. your shoes sooner than that. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Do you have to think about tying your shoe anymore? No. Yeah. No. There's so many things you don't know. You don't have to think about tying your shoes anymore. There's a lot of things you do today that are uh, you're unconsciously competent at, right? There's four levels of this level of consciousness and learning, you know, uh, unconsciously incompetent. I don't know what I don't know. Consci yep. in, uh, consciously incompetent. I know that I don't know. Consciously competent. I know that I know, but I have to work on making sure I execute it right. And unconsciously competent means you just do it because it's a habit, like driving a car, like riding a bike. I haven't been on roller skates in 35 years. I passed a roller skating rink the other day after going to a, a jazz event. And I looked at the roller skating rink. I'm like, man, I haven't been to that roller skating rink since I was probably 22 or 25. I guarantee if I got invited to a party, I would know how to roller skate. What do I mean by that? Because, so I'm habitual now. It's not a matter of, um, it's not, I don't have to practice the habit of being intentionally interested in you because I've been in the world of sales for 30 years. And I've realized that the only way that I build trust and rapport in order to earn a sale in whatever product or service or business I'm in is I have to be interested in solving the problem that my prospect has. Mm -hmm. I can't just sell my product because of its features and its benefits. I have to be interested in marrying my product or service to the problem that needs to be solved. In order to do that, I have to have empathy for where my prospect or customer, or in this case, podcast host is coming from. It's a word I've been using for 20 something years, and it, I'm trying to be interested and empathetic to what they're trying to do. And so that's a whole nother topic of, uh, in the world of sales, but I appreciate you saying that, but it's really more of now a habit. It's just not practical for me, it's not, it's, I can't break the habit of being interested in where I'm supposed to perform. Yeah. Of, I'm just using the word perform, meaning, right. If I'm going to be at a mastermind, like I am tomorrow, I'm all day, eight hours at a mastermind. Wow. It's not, it's not, I just have, there's a way that I operate that day. Yeah. And then also you end up being present, right? So Correct. for example, when you're in that one hour, 30 minute block, right. Of whatever you're doing or for, for tomorrow, eight hour block, right. Yep. You are yep. fully present. You are fully immersed. You're not yep. like the people at the mastermind checking their email, you know, looking nope. for that sort of stimulation because they can't detract from themselves, but yep. you're just, you're completely in it. And my team knows, right. So when I go to these things, when like my phone is on airplane mode right now, cause it's disrespectful to me to have my phone ring and it could, it's disrespectful for anything to happen on that phone at this moment, because I'm here with Nick Lugo on his mm -hmm. show. When I'm at the mastermind tomorrow, my team knows there isn't an emergency that could make you need me tomorrow because we've, we've, we've orchestrated things, right? We, there's just nothing that can happen. Like my, somebody could die. That's an emergency short yeah. of that, you know, car accident. There, there's a couple things in there, right? Where it's an emergency, but very few. Nick, are emergencies. And people use that word too, uh, they use it too loosely and it, and it causes this desire. And, and a lot of it is when I talked about the work we do with some of our clients, we really get in and do the personal work on them first because we can't grow the business if you're stuck. If you're in the middle stuck with your thinking that things have to be a certain way because that's the way it was taught or that's the way you see it done, that is really where uh, the work has to be done. So for me, when I go to these events, 
Uh, it doesn't mean I never open my phone at the event. No, but we have an hour long lunch, sometimes an hour and a half lunch on this eight hour day. I will open my phone at that time, but I'm not doing it on the two 20 minute breaks in the morning and, and all that other stuff. It's I'm intentional when I want to do that. And that's what I like to share with people is be intentional. I check my email when I want to check my email, not because I know there's 15 emails that have accumulated in the last hour. Mm. <laughs> when I get done with this meeting, you and I will take a 30 minute break. You ask me, mm. or I'll take roughly a 15 to 20 minute break. Um, why do I do that? Well, because I want to get up and I want to stretch and I want to breathe and I want to reset myself for the next intention for the next meeting. What am I in the oh. next meeting for? How am I supposed to be like, for example, I'm not in podcast after podcast, after podcast, after podcast. That's, that's not my life every day. Right. So I have to get out of a podcast conversation like with, with you, where I'm sort of on the hot seat to share. And I go into a technical meeting in, in, in about 40 minutes dealing with one of my software, you know, our software partner, then to a meeting with an all team KPI meeting, right? Those are three different I I'm three different people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. With three right? different and, and energies. So, yeah. Completely yeah. And different. that energy, you need a reset point for that energy. And I found that out again, Nick, through how I felt. And I would just tell your audience and, and be mindful of how you feel. If you feel a tug, if you feel a tension, if you feel a certain way, honor that feeling and start to say, what am I feeling right now? And if it's a feeling you don't want to feel, start, just take note of it and say, why am I feeling like this? Right. Listen, as an entrepreneur, this is one of the best ways to look at it. I tell, I tell a lot of entrepreneurs who are, are uh, afraid to scale, afraid to hire teams, um, afraid to go all in on trust with their team, afraid of things going wrong and all this stuff. It's a huge mind block. Um, and they're always stuck in. And this is a thing, a big trait of entrepreneurship is the I'll figure it out mentality. Yeah. Like yeah. I'll figure it out. Like I believe in me, I will figure it out. The problem with I is you will drive yourself crazy trying to figure out things that are not a part of your definite natural ability, mm. right? So some people say double down on your weaknesses. I say double down on your strengths and find people who are, whose weaknesses are their strengths. Sorry, where your weaknesses are their strength. So I believe when I hire people and when I move away from jobs as an entrepreneur, as an entrepreneur, as I grew my businesses, I had to learn to that there was somebody else far more gifted. And this is the first time it happened. And, and this is a simple example, but early in the mortgage days, and if anyone's ever been through a mortgage loan, you're probably, you probably don't have this experience yet. Uh, uh, maybe matter of fact, you may have, maybe you've been through a mortgage loan, but there's a ton of paperwork. And it's annoying paperwork. It's yeah. on everybody's nerves. It's on the loan officer's nerves. It's on the company's nerves. It's the customer's nerves. It's far too much paperwork. The problem is as an originator of the loan, the person who sells the loan to the customer, you know, typically if you don't have a team, you're, you're selling, but then you're processing. And let's just kind of keep it super simple. You're selling and then you're processing. Well, those are two different skill sets. It's almost like the creative brain and the logical brain and you have to be both in, in, in the world. Well, the problem is the person who's a creator, a creator is typically less structured and logical to finish the processing side of it, if that yeah, makes any sense. And they don't want to deal with it. And it's, they don't want to deal with it. Yeah. So the problem is when I go back to this, how do you feel? I recognized that I loved, loved, loved working with people, loved solving problems, loved showing people pathways, loved to use a word you used earlier. It's, a, it's actually in my life plan. I loved creating clarity on the solution. That's yeah. what I live for. It's the easiest thing for me to do. It's hard for some people. It's easy for me. It's just how I'm wired. The logical, structured, procedural, step-by-step, -step, copy all the paperwork 14 times, package it up and send it to 14 lenders, the fax machine and all that stuff that had to happen, it hurt my head. I could do it, but it hurt my head. So and I realized it drains your energy. Yeah. It drains your energy. So I realized I need to find somebody else who loves that stuff. And wow. I remember when I landed the right person, her name was Nicole and we just crushed it. Right. Because you can operate in your gift, um, far better than you can struggle, right. To learn something. There's someone else on this planet and today in a global economy with the way we can work virtually now, there's someone on this planet who 
can operate in that operational efficiency world and give you back your freedom if that is your world. Now, there are some people, uh, like doctors, for example, doctors are skilled. They can't outsource being a medical doctor if they're a, a specialist. A specialist. But, so what we have to do then is build a team around them so they can just do what they do best. You know, I think about a LASIK surgeon that we worked with. And I mean, this guy was, it was like, it was like magic, the way he would fix people's eyes. It was like <laughs> magic, like truly being in the, like in a miracle room with this guy. I mean, just magical. Well, um, that's the best part, right? Like yeah. you just want him to do the thing that he does that's right. best. You just that's want right. him. And you know what, if he's doing the paperwork, then he's just losing all the value. Like, you know, he could be doing something right. that's worth $2,000, but he's really that's doing right. something that's $30. And yeah, it you makes don't sense. go to a concert. You don't go to a concert and expect that the, that the, the star is at the door collecting tickets. Mm -hmm. It makes sense. It makes <laughs> sense. So, but anyways, I did want to be respectful of your time. So um, we're, we're good for a few more minutes. I see the clock and I appreciate that. Yeah. All right. Well, and we can go another yeah. 10 if you want. Okay, sure. Sure. Well, I would like for you to give some, let's say, final thoughts, right? Just just some thoughts on, okay, you know what? What do you think that people should really, especially college kids, should really focus on cultivating in their lives? And what do you think they really, you know, a problem that they experience and something that they could do to really, really start helping it or a lifestyle shift or a mind shift as uh, you guys should follow this <laughs> podcast, the mind shift podcast. Yeah. Um, yeah. What mind shift should they take? First of all, they should follow Nick Lugo. They should watch what Nick Lugo is doing as, as a 20 year old outside the box thinker. It's not about follow Nick Lugo because you want to start a podcast or you want to write a book or you want to become the person who learns everything from, you know, seemingly successful people and then pass that on. It doesn't mean you have to do what Nick Lugo is doing. What I would encourage you to do is to follow understand nick told me something early it was a little bit offline maybe it was when we started the recording that he could feel it's right back to this conversation of feeling nick said you said to me nick you were feeling like this the school thing was good and it is good and, and you, you you value it but you were feeling a certain kind of way that you needed to do and follow this this passion this idea yeah and i think that's the first uh piece of advice i would give if you're a college student listening to this is start to assess how you feel and what you feel is important to you that is calling you, pulling you, nudging you. Don't ignore those feelings. I ignored my entrepreneurial feelings. I started my first business at 20, yes, but I was also still in school and had a job. So I had the blanket and the comfort zone. Yeah. And I tell people all the time that if you're going to succeed, you got to go all in, right? You got to go all in. You can't just stick your toe in the water. Now, I'm not saying drop out of school and all that stuff. What I'm saying is don't ignore the feeling. So that's probably the first piece of practical advice. And it's, it's a subtle understanding. If you, if you feel like, you know, if you feel like my son, you know, uh, my younger son uh, decided to drop out of school and some parents would lose their mind because oh, we yeah. grew up in a school family and all this stuff, they'd lose their mind. And I asked him, so what, do you think you want to do? And he ended up getting a job in the world of sales. Uh, I, I didn't influence that. He, he found his way into the world of fitness, which fitness was a, a passion of his. And he became the number one salesperson at this fitness club from the second month he was there until 21 months later, wow. 23, 21, 22, 23 months later. And here is the piece, Nick. I'm, by the way, it's not shout out to Jordan, by the way, if he happens to be listening. He's 23, by the way. So he's not much older than the more you are. Yeah, I'm 20. And here's what I noticed about that journey. He didn't go do sales because he was going to kill it financially. He did it because it felt good. He did it because he loved the industry. He loves fitness. He loves the idea of being in the fitness world. And when I talked to him week in, week out, uh, he's in Texas, I'm in Las Vegas. I could hear the ease in his voice. It wasn't stressful. I mean, there were times when it was stressful, but the ease of talking to customers, the ease of helping people make the change. He never hard sold anyone. You could hear the ease in his, in his behavior and his being. And so I, that's why I keep going back to the feeling. I didn't have that at 20. I was nervous. I didn't believe in myself. And I told you this earlier, I would have believed in myself a little sooner that I could follow the entrepreneurship path. It took me nine more years to finally make the 100% switch. Uh, switch. Yeah. 
Well, that's the that's thing, probably, you know, yeah. I notice that all the time. Like, you know, I'm, I'm in a business school where <clears throat> pretty much everybody there is doing the things that they, you know, that their parents want them to do the thing that's going to make them the most money. It's, it's the place where it, I say it loosely where souls go to die, you know, like mm. it is. And, and that's, that's what it is. And, um, the problem with that is that I speak to people and mostly finance majors, accounting majors, and I ask them, no money, what would you do? Right? No, right. if money wasn't a factor, what would you do? And the thing is, they have an answer. Yes. Like they actually know and they actually, they feel these things and they actually acknowledge these feelings. But, you know, there's a, there's a block there, obviously, you know, maybe, yeah. maybe it's not the most logistical thing. Maybe it's not, you know, and, and there's, millions of excuses that you could possibly come up with some of them valid some of them not and um and well that's the thing right so one of the greatest quotes that i've ever heard was find your passion and learn how to make money with it and i completely agree yeah i think it's easier today nick than it was if i just jump back 30 years not to time stamp this but there's no excuse today um to not do what it is you want to do you can find a way to do it if you're an artist be an artist and you can monetize your art if it doesn't matter, we could go down the line. I think the, the, the challenge, and this is if I could speak to mind shift for a little bit, these are the things that I had to fight my way through and, and over years realized that I'd actually sort of built a process and a mechanism to mentally make these changes. And that is number one, look at what the facts are that you're, you're looking at. Like, so I want to do this, but here are the facts. We're not trying to say the facts aren't relevant. The facts are facts, but that the facts are no longer a condition of our future though. See, so the facts may be something that happened in our past. I love what uh, Eckhart Tolle talks about in the power of now, which is, you know, our past is no, is just, it is what it is, but our now is today. And our now is a, a minute from now. And our now is the next minute from now and the next week from now. So we can create our future in any new now moment that we want. Right. So mm. we, we, we like to look backwards. And by the way, another fun fact that I found out through the world of psychology study, and I don't know where it finds it, but he says, the further away you get, from the actual facts of the event, whatever the event is, the more false your recollection of it is. Yes. If I started telling a story about some trauma that happened to me in my 20s, I'm probably going to mess up the facts because it's so far removed and my brain is now reaching to fill in holes because I've let that fact go. But, you know, to, so bottom line is whatever the facts are and whatever your situation is, the step number two in the mindship method is to make a new decision about what you want to do from here going forward, right? What is the new decision? What is the new distinction? Are you, speaking of Anthony Robbins, you brought up the uh, Awaken the Giant Within. I, yeah. I don't know if it was an unlimited power or Awaken the Giant Within, but I remember this quote and it has stuck with me forever. It's in the moment of your decision that your destiny is shaped. Oh, yeah, that's Awaken Your Giant Within. In the moment of your decision, your destiny is shaped. And that is an ownership quote to me. It's a leadership quote. It's not, it's not, it's like, hey, when did I make the decision to do the thing? Maybe the end result of winning or losing is five years later, 10 years later, but the originating decision was that was here. And so the question is, is what new decision or distinction will you make today? And then the next step is what kind of what plan do I need to enact? What plan do I need to put in place to make that interesting? You know, like the fact that right now. If you look into your future, there are 10, 20, 30, 40, 5 million different paths that you could sure. go. And, you know, like I, it took me, it took me a lot of quieting of mind to figure this out, but to some degree, I could actually see the paths like, okay, you know what, if I, you know, take a step in this direction towards school, then I'm going to go in this direction. And, or if I take a step in this direction towards podcasting, then I'm going to go in this direction. And the futures look completely different. And it's just, it's crazy, you know, like we don't really have that perspective. We kind of pick a, pick a path and lock into it. But when you have that perspective, yes. And that is the power of now that is the, the power of, let's say consciousness to be able to look and see those multiple paths. It is, it, it changed the way I view the world because now I see, okay, maybe the world's a little bit more malleable than I could expect. Right. Here's, here's Nick to add onto that. That was a great, a great distinction. Unfortunately, a lot of people can see the path. And then they won't decide. They won't decide to take one because they think all the paths have the same outcomes. I tell people a lot, a lot of times that most of the time you're stuck because you just aren't in the game. Mm. The best thing you can do to succeed in anything you do in life is to get in the game 
take small measurable steps, measure your progress and take the next step and then measure your progress and take the next step. It's the evolution of business growth. It's the evolution of weight loss. It's the evolution of learning. It's the evolution of any skill that you develop in life, any outcome, you know, people that are in the hall of fame, I'm a huge sports fan. So I always use sports analogies. You look at any player in the hall of fame, they went through adversity. They went yeah. through trouble. They went through drama. They went through heartache. They went through pain. They went through injury. They went through multiple coaches, multiple teams, drama in locker room problems, all this stuff, but their craft, they made a dedicated commitment to practice every single day and do the things that other people weren't willing to do. But some people who see the pathways, like you just described, won't get in the game. Yeah. They need yep. to get in the game. A boat can't do what it was built to do when it's sitting in the Harbor. <laughs> you want to hear a great analogy that I heard and then we'll, and then we'll end it. It was uh, by Penny Zanker. She was on this podcast and she, you ever heard of the hot and cold game that you play when you're a kid, right? Like you close your eyes and you say, Oh, you're going, you're getting warmer. You're getting warmer or oh, yeah, you're yeah. getting colder yeah. and colder. Right. You yeah, know, yeah. very, very childish game. Yeah. Imagine what is the only way that you can fail in that game? If you don't oh. move. Gotcha. Right. Right. Like imagine that we're moving through life and we're just completely lost. And well, the only way that you could fail is if you don't get feedback and you don't learn and you don't keep moving and you don't figure out what's hotter and what's colder and all of these things. And, um, and yeah, yeah, you're right. People just don't make that decision. So yeah, and they're, I think they're afraid of failure, which is the biggest thing. And we'll just, we just finish it off with this. Um, what I've learned in my life, anytime where I was stuck and I was afraid to afraid of an outcome, afraid of failure, because that's really what stops most of us. And I've learned just now after all these years, um, provided we get to a level of conscious competence, right? If we can get past, if, if we can get to conscious competence, failure is rarely final. It's rarely, if ever final, and it is rarely, if ever fatal. Mm -hmm. And if we could just accept that that is the truth, um, then we can be okay in the feedback loop, right? Because that's all learning is it's feedback, right? And that feedback makes you a better person. I played sports. And so the sports analogy is we practice Monday through Wednesday or Tuesday through Thursday. We played a game on Friday or Saturday and we watched the film the day after the game or two days after the game before we started the practice routine again. And in the, in the film, we would see what we did right. We would see what we did wrong. And we would go practice to get better at what we did right and correct the things we did wrong, right? Correct the discipline, correct the errors of the past and position ourselves with better discipline for the future, better habits for the future, which is the evolution of this process called learning and growth. And we're all here to grow in many ways. And a lot of times we just stunt our growth uh, because we don't believe in ourselves. And we just think that, you know, what we see is all there is. And I think what we've talked about today, and, and I appreciate you, Nick, uh, before we part, uh, I said this before we started the recording or, or in our email or right when we, I appreciate what you're doing. I appreciate the Thank platform you. you're building. I appreciate the way that you've adjusted your, your mental capacity and strength is advanced. It's beyond your years. You're going to build a huge platform. You're going to be wildly successful. And I believe you're going to lead a lot of folks in your generation. You use the word colleagues when we were talking earlier. I'm like, what 20 year old <laughs> uses the word colleagues? Like for crying out loud, um, you've got a 3.9 GPA. You are you are hitting it on all cylinders. I will just keep saying, I'll say what I said before. People listening to the show should follow Nick Lugo. This kid is impressive. He's doing big things. He's got a heart of abundance. Uh, he's got a heart of service. And it's been an absolute pleasure sharing some time with you, my man. Thank you. Thank you. And everybody, make sure to check out the Mind Shift podcast because this man, as you could tell, is, I could, I could be beyond my years, but you are well beyond my years. And, um, <laughs> well, literally, cause I'm 51. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, literally. I am. Oh my but. God. And I am, I have like 15 different nuggets of wisdom that I'm going to take from this. So thank you so much. And, oh God, this was incredible. Thank you. It absolutely audience. was. And I, I equally say the same, and I was honored to, when I saw the invitation and I checked out your background, um, just again, thank you for, for creating a platform, allowing me to be here. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Nick Lugo Show with Darrell Evans. To support this podcast, please make sure to give me a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or to subscribe to my YouTube channel. These things help more than you know. And finally, to close off this episode, I will give you a, a quote from the famous American columnist, Marilyn Voss Savant. 
Being defeated is often a temporary condition. Giving up is what makes it permanent. Go out there and kill it, guys. And thank you for watching this episode.